Greetings. Welcome to Freedom House on a rainy day. Uh, it's a bit of a rainy day for the situation in Europe and Eurasia, as this report will indicate. It's a pleasure to welcome you here to our headquarters. Since 1995, Freedom House's Nations in Transit has provided an annual examination of the state of democracy in 29 formerly communist countries in Europe and Eurasia. Of the 29 countries, which range from the Czech Republic to Kyrgyzstan, um, they represent a concentrated group for looking at a study of transitions or lack of transitions to democracy. Transitions don't necessarily end. When Nations in Transit started in 1995, I doubt that um, people would have thought that we'd be in the state we are now. It's fair to say Freedom House was among those who were optimistic and believed that with enough effort and resources, transition to democracy was just a matter of time. All of these countries would make it to democracy. Well, 21 years later, we know that the transition in many cases hasn't happened. In fact, perhaps a transition has occurred to a steady state of autocratic or illiberal rule in some places. Nearly half of the countries that emerged from the Soviet Union, seven out of the 15, uh, see one type of dictatorship of, or another, where one form of dictatorship has morphed into another steady state form of dictatorship, ruled by single leaders who brook no opposition to their rule, warp the economy to fill their own pockets, of those their family and those in their inner circle. Just as disturbing has been the steady regression away from democracy in the European part of the region, that area that initially had made the most progress. The European Union's enlargement agenda incentivized change to offer accession with standards, incentivized change, and yet we see challenges throughout the EU today. The Eurozone debt crisis, migration, terrorism, with profound implications for the stability, rightly understood, and the democratic project in Central Europe and the Balkans. What happens in Central Europe and the Balkans has profound implications for democracy across Europe. We are refocusing programmatically at Freedom House on Central Europe and on the Balkans. What we're seeing is more and more the emergence of nativist and nationalist parties and governments um, that reject the fundamental principles of liberal democracy. In fact, embracing something called illiberal democracy. Rejecting checks and balances, rejecting rule of law, rejecting independence of institutions, especially the judiciary. We're watching with deep concern and deep care what's happening in Central Europe. I'd like to hand things over to Nate Schenken, who I have special esteem for as an innovator, project director of Nations in Transit. He's going to present the results of this year's survey and introduce our worthy panelists. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Um, I'll be brief in the presentation. We have a terrific panel, and I want to have time to talk with them. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge that Nations in Transit is made possible by the generous support of the US Agency for International Development, and we thank USAID for its ongoing support. I also want to acknowledge the work of my colleagues at Freedom House, without whom the report could not have happened, Robert Ruby, Anna Kosma, um, Emmeline Glenn, on a bar, and most of all, Jeka Chaki, who's our senior research analyst on NIT and has worked day and night to make this happen. And I want to thank the authors of our 29 country reports, um, some of whom I hope are watching now, uh, without whom none of this would have been possible. So it's been a tough run for democracy in the nations in transit region over the last decade. And in 2015, the negative trends that we've documented for years continued and intensified. As Mark said, Europe is facing profound challenges to its unity, fueled still by the fallout from the Eurozone debt crisis, as well as by new challenges in migration and increasingly terrorism. There is a rising tide of populist nationalism that is very skeptical of democratic institutions, and it is sweeping across Europe. In Eurasia, meaning the, the 12 non-Baltic states of the former Soviet Union, there is a profound economic crisis setting in, 
that is driven by the oil price collapse and US sanctions against Russia, which as a single country still accounts for 74% of Eurasia's GDP. And in response to this crisis, crackdowns are intensifying across that region. Weighted for population, which is the second horizontal line here, it has been 10 years in a row that we've had more declines than improvements in the category scores in the Nations in Transit survey. And the biggest driver has been the decline in Russia's score in the last 12 years, and particularly since Vladimir Putin returned to the presidency in 2011. And this year, Russia's score declined yet again due to the implementation of the foreign agents law that has driven a surprisingly large number of NGOs underground and into exile. Eurasia is defined by dictatorship. As Mark said, seven of the 12 countries in the region are dictatorships. Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Russia, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Belarus, Azerbaijan. These are countries ruled by men who've been in power anywhere from 10 to 27 years. But now these leaders are facing unprecedented challenges as oil prices decline and Russia's economy recedes. This economic crisis in Eurasia threatens the region's stability as a social compact that had delivered some growth and stable, albeit brutal, governance to citizens in exchange for their cooperation may be breaking down. This is not just impacting the oil and gas producers of the region. It is also hitting the countries that rely on Russia for migrant remittances, as we see here in this slide. In Uzbekistan, in Tajikistan, in Moldova, Kyrgyzstan, Armenia, Remittances are down anywhere from 45% to almost 70% year on year. Eurasia also features one of the two worst performers in this year's survey, and that's Tajikistan, where in response to this worsening crisis, the government has pursued an incredibly vicious crackdown on the opposition that has left some 200 members of the Islamic Renaissance party imprisoned. In the Balkans, the promising gains of the mid-2000s have basically been reversed, as the region is now back where it started in terms of consolidation of democracy in the Nations in Transit survey. If you look at this black line, that's the average that you can see returning in kind of a loop. Despite the fact that there has been steady progress towards EU membership for much of the region, including for Serbia, which opened its first EU chapters in 2015, that progress has not been matched for most countries by improvements in democracy scores. And that raises a question that I hope we'll discuss today of whether the EU's enlargement strategy is overly focused on stability above progress in the Balkans. The Balkans had the other, regis, uh, other largest decline this year, and that was in Macedonia, where revelations of massive electoral fraud and criminal cover-ups by the government prompted a total political crisis that has required EU mediation and is still unresolved. The story for Nations in Transit this year is not just about Eurasia's retreat from democracy or stagnation in the Balkans. We've also seen substantial declines in Central Europe, which has always been the best performing region in Nations in Transit and continues to be. The leading cause of this has been Hungary. Nations in Transit has been documenting Hungary's decline since 2005, but has seen that score dropped most steeply since 2010 under Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Now in this past year, we see Orban's approach paying off and actually being imitated in other parts of Europe. In 2015, Orban was the leading voice in Europe denouncing the threat of migrants in xenophobic terms and turning the threat of terrorism to his political advantage. This so-called Hungary approach, especially to borders, is something that we saw spread across not just the nations in transit region in Central Europe, but into Western Europe as well. And in Poland, after the Law and Justice Party won elections in October, the new government moved within months to enact changes to state media and the constitutional tribunal that closely resemble what Orban did when Fidesz took office in 2010. Now, for good reason, Russian aggression and the spread of authoritarian tactics have been a major focus for nations in transit for years, and they continue to be. That is why supporting Ukraine, helping Ukraine become a democracy is the single most important project for advancing democracy in the Eurasia region. But increasingly, in addition to the external threat 
to Europe's unity and liberty. There's also an internal threat in the form of state capture and the return of virulent nationalism. And the past year has shown just how profound that threat can be. A Europe whole and free is still a valid concept for addressing the issues the continent faces, but it must be updated now to respond to the dangers within. So thank you. With that, I'd like to invite our panelists to join me and to turn on your mics. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, we have with us Alina, Alina Polyakova, who's the deputy director of the Dinu Patricius Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council, where she is engaged with the council's work on Russia and Ukraine. Previously, she was a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and a senior research fellow and lecturer at the University of Bern. Next to her, we have Florian Bieber, professor of Southeast European Studies and director of the Center for Southeast European Studies at the University of Graz in Austria. He is a visiting professor at the Nationalism Studies Program at Central European University and has taught at the University of Kent, Cornell University, the University of Bologna, and the University of Sarajevo. And then lastly, Annabelle Chapman is a Warsaw-based journalist writing for The Economist and Politico Europe. Her articles from Central and Eastern Europe have also been published in Foreign Policy, Newsweek, Foreign Affairs, The Financial Times, and Monocle. She holds a master's in Russian and East European studies from Oxford University. Welcome, all of you. Let's start in Europe, um, as this is clearly one of the big themes in this year. And let's start with this question about illiberal democracy that Mark mentioned as well. Alina, you've been following this topic, um, the issue of right-wing parties, the issue of right-wing nationalism resurgent in Europe for a number of years. You wrote a book about it. Um, what's the state of play in 2015 and going into 2016 uh, for these parties? Well, that's a really interesting question because uh, just looking at the report and some of the findings in the report, I think corroborate what we've seen more broadly in the rise of not just nationalist populism, but far-right extremism more broadly. And when we talk about far extremism, we're not talking about parties like Fidesz, which is Viktor Orban's party in Hungary. We're talking about parties like Jobbik, for example, which are even further to the right of the center-right parties. And what we've seen, uh, I would say, over the last eight years or so, particularly since the financial crisis of 2008, is this merging of the mainstream right and, and the far right. So we see the, the centrist right parties really taking up the agenda of the far right extremists when it comes to issues like immigration, xenophobia, uh, some anti-democratic media censorship issues. And then we also see the far right trying to compete with the center right, but moving closer to the center. So these lines between what we would normally call the extremists and the, and the center right parties are really blending and becoming harder and harder to disintegrate. And if we look at how Europe responded to the financial crisis and now the refugee crisis, what we see is, is a rise in parliamentary elections um, and, the, and how these parties are able to garner more and more support um, in their own national politics and also in European institutions like the European Parliament. Um, so going forward, it's interesting that uh, Eastern Europe was really not much of a foothold for the far right previous to 2008. But that is changing quite dramatically now. Yeah. And so let's, in, in Poland, where a lot of people have made an association between, as I just did, between Hungary and, and Polish developments um, in terms of the rise of the peace, is that a, an adequate comparison? Is that correct? Or is that sort of oversimplifying the issue too much? I think that um, when we're discussing democracy in the region and so on, the political scientists um, have their terms, democracy, illiberal democracy, and so on. I think it's also interesting to look at the language that the parties use to describe themselves. Hmm. So in Poland, if you talk to people from the ruling law and justice party, um, they are very dismissive of the term liberalism. It's become almost like a, a dirty word or an insult to call someone a liberal or a lefty and so on. Mm -hmm. So um, I was talking to one of the ministers in the government, and he was saying that when, um, when he was growing up in Poland under communism, um, they had socialist democracy in inverted commas. And then under the previous government, the civic platform, there was liberal democracy, and now he would just like democracy without adjectives. Mm. But, he, but they reject the illiberal label. Well, I mean, I think nobody would really want to 
call themselves liberal, you Except know? maybe Orban <laughs> <laughs> a few years ago. Um, it, it, I mean, I'd, I'd, li I'd like to hear your opinions. Florian, I wanted to ask you about the Balkans specifically, but maybe we can hear more about the opinions about this illiberal democracy adjective in a moment. But in the Balkans, mm -hmm. is it... Is it adequate to apply this kind of label, illiberal democracy? Is it a different type of governance? I mean, I think you, you do have that kind of illiberal democracy as well on the Balkans. I mean, and you have governments, I mean, some of the rulers have been in power for 25 years nearly. I mean, if you take mm -hmm. Montenegro, mm -hmm. uh, the ruling, the prime minister Milo Djukanovic is, is, is well, you know, good in competing with some of the gentlemen you've been uh, been displaying, although, you know, arguably with more democratic uh, means, but still there's a dominance of a few uh, leaders for, you know, over a decade in some cases. If you look at uh, parts of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Republika Srpska there, Milo Radori, has been dominating for a decade in Macedonia as well, mm -hmm. where we've seen the decline uh, in terms of democracy scores over the recent years with um, the Gruevsky government. So we have that. But I think, I mean, and that's an interesting question is the importance of ideology. And I think this comes back to what Alina was talking about is, you know, to which degree is it actually for coming from the right, the extreme mm -hmm. right, or is it coming from the center? Because I think what we see in, 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 in many of the Balkan countries is that the liberal democracy is instituted not by the extreme right, but it's by centrist parties who are using strategies of undermining democratic institutions to stay in power. They're not driven by ideology primarily, um, unlike, let's say, in Hungary or in Poland, where there's a strong ideological kind of underpinning. Um, in places like Serbia and places like Macedonia, yes, ideology sometimes serves as a useful vehicle, but it's not central to it. Um, and in fact, if you take Serbia as a case where we're going to have elections and where, where there's a, a strong kind of, I would say, illiberal strand in the, the way democracy functions at the moment, the government claims to be pro-European, pro-reformist, right. yet doing everything to undermine uh, democratic institutions. So, so I think you can have that illiberal democracy without ideology. Mm. And the Balkans is, I think, the best example of that. Mm -hmm. But do you think, Annabelle, Alina, do you, do you think that a liberal democracy with ideology is an adequate way of discussing it in Central Europe? Do you think it is primarily or even secondarily ideological? Or do you think it's more about particular parties capturing the state for their interests? How would you characterize it? Well, that's an interesting question. And I don't want to do the discussion too far afield. Please do. Uh, <laughs> But I think one thing to consider here is the extent to which Russia has become um, a sort of um, an aspirational type of regime for some of these uh, center-right or formerly center-right parties. And if we talk about ideology, um, I think that if we look at how Russia has thought to ally align itself with certain political groups in Europe, particularly in Eastern Europe, it's very much pushed for an alignment with these far right or now the center right parties, people like Orban, of course, um, are big admirers of Putin very openly. Uh, and Serbia, I think Serbia is a really interesting case because on the one hand, they are pro-Russian, on the one hand, they're pro-Western, so they're trying to kind of play both sides. But I think we think about what that means. I mean, what is, what is the, the meat and the core of that connection? Is it just about um, having, you know, uh, the Russian government give you money when you, when you need that for your electoral campaign, like what happened in France with Marine Le Pen? Or is there an ideological core to this? And I actually think that there is something there. There is this vision of, you know, we can call it a liberal democracy, you can call it um, managed democracy, you can call it Putinism, right? Um, there is this sort of alternative worldview um, that is being set up by, and Russia is really the head of this, that these other countries are seeking to emulate. Mm. Do you think this applies in Poland? Animal? I mean, I, th I think the current dispute in Poland goes back much deeper than the previous elections in the past few years, but goes back to the transition you know, of 1989 and the early 1990s. What happened then and how people view the past 25 years. So for the, for the previous government, the centrist civic platform, it was all a success, you know, Poland getting richer, moving closer to the West and joining the European Union and NATO. For the current government, um, the past 25 years have been a sort of sham with a lot of um, nasty things going on under the surface, um, crooks, post-communists and so on. And they're saying that, you know, there's been this nice narrative about moving towards liberalism and democracy and so on. But in fact, it's all been fake. And now we want to have this more um, Polish approach. And I've never really seen this kind of suspicion towards um, the outside before, whether that's Berlin or Brussels. I think the United States is still in quite a privileged position here. But it clearly resonates with the Polish public, this narrative. 
Yes, and, and I think that the more um, Brussels and so on criticizes Poland, the ruling party is able to present this as criticism, not of their reforms and changes, but of Poland itself. And that really hits people, I think. So, so let's move and talk about the EU. Or sorry, Florian. Maybe just to jump in here, it's cool. And they sometimes converge, and sometimes they don't. Because if you take, for example, Croatia, which had a has a conservative government for several months, which has not instituted any of the mechanisms of a liberal democracy so far, but has revived the similar ideological battles as in Poland over uh, you know, the division of the country between the, you know, the righteous protectors of the nation and the post-communists. You see that <coughs> very similar debate, you know, flirting with rehabilitating some of the you know, World War II co collaborationists. Mm -hmm. So, so th that, I think, emulates a lot of this and also kind of the, the close alliance with the, with the Catholic Church. All of that is very similar in Croatia as it is in Poland, but there the government does not propose to, in a certain way, dismantle the institutions uh, of the previous uh, government. So I think you have the ideology and you have the, the, the mechanisms of rule, and it becomes particularly dangerous when they converge, of course, mm -hmm. but they can work separately in a certain way, both as right. parties out of power and as, you know, de-ideologized parties in power who don't use that and still undermine democratic institutions. Right. I'll just respond to that, that um, the Law and Justice Party is the first party to win a, a majority in, in Poland um, over the past 25 years. So now they can effectively, they have more capacity to pass through changes in parliament, but also they use it as an argument. They say, you know, we're, we're democratically elected, so on, we can do what we want, which um, is probably not a very convincing argument and so on. And, but they still don't have the constitutional majority that Orban has. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But so so there is, I mean, because you're saying whether it's ideological or non-ideological, there, there's a frustration or a disillusionment with the democratic process and with checks and balances and institutions. Um, I know we're getting somewhat abstract, but I am interested why this widespread disillusionment in so many countries with the fundamentals of democracy? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that I think we have to also understand these processes uh, to the rise of national populism, nativism, isolationism, et cetera, in, in the context of, one, the European crisis, but also these really rapid integration processes that have happened across Europe you know, since the inception of the European Union. Um, so when you have very rapid economic integration, political integration at the EU level, um, there's a backlash that can happen to that, right? When you have open borders, and people's communities and societies are changing incredibly quickly, um, maybe people don't want to see that happening anymore in such a rapid pace. So a lot of these parties, we shouldn't forget these kind of center-right or far-right, illiberal democratic uh, leaders are actually first and foremost anti-EU and anti-sort of European Union integration. They want their national sovereignty back. They want to have control over their borders. Um, they want to have control over their economic systems. I mean, we could argue that that's misguided because, you know, if any country at this point leaves the EU, particularly in the Eastern European states, they will lose a lot economically. And so the question I would wonder for you, Flora, is that a strategy that only works once you're inside the EU? But you know, I think this is the interesting kind of counterpoint is in the Balkans, you have a similar pattern of illiberal democracy, and yet they stick to the EU message. Right. Um, now, it's not a very convincing, you know, they're not very convincing um, salespeople of the EU integration uh, story, but because they feel like there's no alternative. I mean, even, uh, of course, sure. although that narrative has collapsed with the, with the economic crisis, uh, but I think they want it because they feel like they are more sovereign in. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think the argument in the Balkans is very strong that if we're not in, the foreign powers will dictate our future. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's seen as a way to safeguard against external meddling rather than as kind of this understanding of sharing sovereignty. But I think, you know, the, the key point for me is that you have to keep in mind, you know, the economic crisis is still, you know, maybe Poland is actually an interesting counterpoint to that, but the other countries very much felt by people. It's been going on for a long period of time. And I mean, and the Balkans always say, if you are, if you are, uh, you know, in your 40s, growing up uh, in, in the, the 80s was economic crisis in Yugoslavia, um, the 90s was war, uh, the 2000s saw a few years of economic growth, and then not for the last uh, eight, nine years, again, you have economic crisis. So normal is crisis. Uh, in, in, in the post-Yugoslav space. So, you know, your experience with transition uh, is, in fact, going back to the 1980s, and it's an experience of impoverishment, of unemployment. Uh, so the people saying, you know, you need liberal democracy, you need uh, market reforms, doesn't resonate. People say, we've been doing this for 25 years, and it's not getting better, it's getting right. worse. Right. So I think this is why alternatives are looking more attractive. 
It's the frustration with we're waiting for 25 years to join the EU, waiting for the fruits of you know, market reforms for 25 years, and we're just not seeing it. And I think this fuels, of course, those who say, well, we have a better alternative. I want to turn to the EU in a little more detail, but I wanted to mention to the audience, because I failed to do it earlier, there will be going around note cards for you to write down questions that my colleagues will collect, and you can hand them up to me, and we'll take a few of those at the end. Um, on the EU, uh, let's, let's start with this thing you mentioned about Poland, about the potential for backlash, but I actually wanted to focus right now on the, the EU's perspective on that. Do you think the EU has learned from what happened with Hungary? when um, the Fidesz government made a number of very rapid moves six years ago, and the EU was largely quiet or slow to react. Mm -hmm. um, do you think they're trying to avoid a repeat of that? I think the EU is learning all the time, actually. Um, mm. It um, you know, launched this uh, rule of law procedure in, in January, which was a first for the EU and so on. And now it's, um, it's, been, it's calmed down a little bit. It's been quite tentative and so on. There have been debates going on in the European Parliament, which cannot really do anything. But Poland is somewhere there in the background all the time. But there's been so much going on in the EU recently with the migration crisis and the terror attacks in Brussels that Poland is somewhere there in the background. But um, the Venice Commission, this organ of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, has issued this um, critical report of, of the situation in, in Poland. And I think that's going to continue having repercussions. But as you're saying, I think it's a, it's a, it's a work in progress. And the EU has to kind of be be very kind of subtle about the things it does, I think, under the surface and so on, nudging Warsaw and telling it to kind of slow down, mm -hmm. and also the, the public message it gives. Mm. But you feel that the U.S. has a different position vis-a-vis -vis Poland? You mm -hmm. mentioned The U.S., the United States, has a different position vis-a-vis -vis Poland or a different voice and authority there, perhaps? I mean, we've been talking about this in Warsaw, and I think that it's a bit of a game of good cop, bad cop, in a way. Mm. That, you know, Brussels is the one telling Poland off, and, um, and the United States have a certain authority in Poland, I think, because of, you know, the symbol of democracy over during the communist years and so on, but now also as a kind of guarantor of Europe's um, security with NATO and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, I mean, maybe there's different sides to this and so on, but I think the US is thinking of how it can sort of leverage what's happening in Poland. Yeah, I do know there's a discussion happening in the United States about how to react to what mm -hmm. ha what's happening in Poland. Uh, people are certainly following it closely. Florian, I, the same question about enlargement, or about the EU, rather, um, and whether you th do you think the EU has learned from the enlargement processes, the very big bang, the rapid enlargement? Well, you know, I think the EU is, is also, I mean, it's, it's constantly learning, and I agree with Annabelle on that, but it's also, of course, it's multiple actors, and they act mm -hmm. in very different directions sometimes. And I think one nice illustration is European party families. I mean, I think mm -hmm. the difference in reaction to Poland and Hungary can be partly explained by the fact that, uh, that Fidesz in Hungary is part of the European People's Party, which means it has allies in government in many European capitals, mm -hmm. while in Poland. And I think we see that also in the Balkans, these party families often play, uh, unfortunately, not the role that they were intended two decades ago to moderate and modernize parties uh, in Central and Southeastern Europe, but instead it's the tail wagging the dog. It's been very much integrating people's minds, so why are we punishing Russia when Ukraine can't get its act together, right? Um, so I think going forward, uh, we're going to have to see if the Ukrainian government can actually uh, stabilize, if we can have a coalition that will release European support for Ukraine. What we have seen is actually quite a bit of European support for Ukraine, a bit of a great deal of financial support, of course, all conditional, um, and not so much in, in the military front, of course. But I think, you know, going forward, Ukraine, it's really up to Ukraine at some point to step up um, and to show the Europeans and also the U.S. that they're still worthy of investment of support. On the other hand, just as a, as a, as a last comment on this, I think the European Union missed a huge opportunity in Ukraine. And part of what's happening now, I think it, it, we can draw a line. And by, by that, I mean when the Maidan happened um, in 2013, 2014, uh, that was the only time that I can think of that citizens died on the street for European values. And what other country, uh, died, what, in what other country are people being killed on the streets because they want to be part of the EU? Um, and that was a moment where Europe, which was a, already in, a, in its own kind of identity crisis that still re continues to be in today, could have really taken up um, 
you know, the calls of the Ukrainian people and said, you know, this is what Europe is about. It is about freedom. It is about enlightenment values. It is, it is about democracy. These are the European values that people are not questioning across all of these countries. Mm -hmm. And it, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So I think it, that opportunity was lost. Uh, the Ukrainians felt abandoned in some ways. And now we have a political crisis, which is, I think, still uh, the blame for that lays, uh, lies with the Ukrainian elite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a little distracting, but how is the Ukrainian project or the efforts in Ukraine perceived in the Balkans? Is there a perception of this as a you know, new frontier in Europe? Is there frustration that there's more attention being paid to Ukraine than there is to countries that have been working on candidacy for a very long time? Yeah, it certainly, it certainly comes up in different contexts. I mean, of course, when, when the issue of, of visa liberalization was discussed mm -hmm. for, for Ukraine, it created a lot of resentment in Kosovo because Kosovo is, of course, one of the countries which does not have um, uh, visa fee travel to the European Union. There was a sense of, you know, we are, we are a part of the Western Balkans. We have a, a membership perspective, yet our citizens cannot travel to Europe while Ukrainians can. Um, so I, and I think it's, you know, of course, diverts the energy. Uh, uh, but also, uh, I think it also, the Ukraine has been one of, one of the difficult issues in the Balkans because it does, you know, the polarization between the European Union or the West more broadly and Russia, of course, forces countries in the region who have this kind of split identity to take sides more clearly in a way where before the Ukraine, uh, they could say, well, we're both pro-Russian, both pro -Russian, pro european it's not a problem. Of course, now it's much harder to make that argument. So I think that that's kind of been the main impact of, of, of Ukraine on, uh, on, on particular debates in, in places like Serbia uh, mm -hmm. and, and parts of Bosnia. Right. And in Poland, is there interest in the Ukrainian? I mean, as a bordering country, as a, mm -hmm. an important neighbor, how much interest is there in the outcome of the, you, the process? Well, Ukraine? I mean, it's, it's quite, a, quite a sad situation because over the past, um, sort of since 1991, since Ukrainian independence, then Poland has been the foremost advocate of closer relations mm -hmm. between Ukraine and the West. And also during the Maidan crisis, I think Poland was... Um, was very supportive of Ukraine and so on, although increasingly preoccupied with its own election campaigns and internal things. And this is getting, in fact, worse, that Poland still kind of cares about Ukraine and is very much pro-Ukrainian and anti-Russian, but um, is increasingly distracted by other things. So first of all, its own internal um, political problems, this polarization, but also the refugee crisis. And um, if you go up to the Baltic states or to Poland, then you find that the bigger threat now is coming from some Syrians who haven't even arrived in, uh, in these countries, you know, a, a few families really, rather than Russia, which is there all the time. Mm -hmm. And this is um, very much to Russia's advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Building on that, um, there's a lot of discussion in Washington, I think there's now a lot of discussion in Europe, about Russia exploiting divisions in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly something that uh, is, a, is a live agenda item, both the Russian exploitation and the fact that even in countries like the Baltics, mm -hmm. very distant from the Syrian conflict and from the flow of refugees, somehow this issue becomes a major agenda item. I'll, I'll start with you, Annabelle. Do, do you, how much do you think Russian propaganda and Russian efforts to inflame these issues plays a role in how um, prominent they've become in, let's say, the Baltics in 2015? I think um, in, in the Baltic states, the first families have arrived recently, you know, um, I think two families of, of Syrians in, in each country. So it's very small numbers and so on. But I think that... Um, these countries are quite, um, there's a sense of threat in, in countries like Lithuania and Latvia of sort of internal um, interference from sending in people like before there was the Soviet um, period then Russians were coming in and now this um, sense of sending in Syrians and not being able to kind of, um, you know, it's, it, it sounds irrational and, and so on. But I think that the that the refugee crisis is now being seen as, as the main threat. So this is another issue, though, where you connect yeah. it to the transition, where mm -hmm. you connect it to that history of Soviet citizens, Russians, were sent into our country kind of to, um, you know, dilute our national, um, the, the, na the nation. And now we, they, they make a comparison uh, of the same type of thing of refugees coming? Yes, um, mm. on, on the far right. But also these countries um, have a, their own history of emigration um, during mm -hmm. the 
during World War II and so on. A, a lot of people from the Baltics um, emigrated to, to Scandinavia, to the United States and so on. And I think people sometimes tend to forget about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Alina, in Central Europe, I know you've been following it closely, how much do you think the big backlash, the huge backlash that took place in 2015, how much of it, how much of it was fueled by Russian propaganda? Well, I think we're talking about Russian influence in Europe more broadly. It's not just about Russian influence in the media space. That's a huge part of it. Um, but Russia has, I think, unleashed a relatively clear strategy for how it seeks to gain a foothold in some of these countries. Of course, by establishing media operations um, in the local languages specifically, which, you know, we can question um, how many people actually watch, you know, RT in German or in other languages. But I don't think the, the purpose of Russian, the Russian information campaign is to influence public opinion. Because if it was, then it would be considered a failure. Because over the last uh, three years, uh, particularly since the Ukraine crisis, public opinion across Europe and Russia has declined dramatically. Um, nobody wants, I mean, in terms of just, you know, opinion polling, people don't see Putin as an admirable leader. Uh, they see Russia as a threat. So we can look at those statistics and say, look, Russian propaganda, the Russian media campaign has failed in Europe. But in fact, um, I don't think that's true. Because I think the, the subject and object of Russian media um, influence has been the influencers, right? So the media commentators, uh, the policy writers, the policy makers as well. And so it's about shifting the narrative and like the Brexit debate. I mean, there's speculation. We don't have you know, clear cut evidence, but there's a lot of speculation that a lot of these narratives about Brexit and Britain wanting to leave, which would be terrible for, for Britain, actually, economically speaking, um, is fueled by some of these Russian narratives. And I think if you look outside the media space, um, the other things that Russia has been able to do incredibly well is, of course, establish these uh, networks uh, with the far right extremist groups. Um, by funding some of these groups outright. Um, on the other hand, building up these networks uh, by inviting various members and leaders of these far-right uh, political parties, which are increasingly becoming more popular, as we we're talking about, and they have a pro-Russian stance. Um, and, and the other piece of it has been this um, export of the corruption networks and the kleptocracy networks across Eastern Europe, which I think we in the West have been very slow to investigate and to respond to as a result. Um, so I think a lot of these, it's a very complex web, but I think the sooner we wake up to the fact that um, some of the, you know, it's not a causal chain, but I would argue that some of the declines in democracy uh, have a lot to do with, with Russian man manipulation of the media and political space across Central Eastern Europe specifically, uh, which has really become the, the, the key area for, for Russian influence today. Florian, do you think that holds in the Balkans? Well, I'm, I'm a bit more skeptical about the Russian influence uh, on the media space and on, on politics. I think Russia has been an act, I mean, I, I see this in the Balkans, has been acting uh, when there's an opportunity. So it's a very opportunistic uh, uh, intervener uh, in the sense that if there's an opening, if there's an issue which you can exploit, it's used strategically, but it's not in a certain way. I mean, whether it's Brexit or whether it's uh, also the kind of xenophobic response to the to refugees, I mean, these are domestic they're caused by domestic debates. Mm -hmm. Yes, there might be then the ability to use those uh, to your advantage or to play into them. But, you know, again, I think the British debate about Brexit, the, 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 the kind of hostility towards refugees uh, in countries like Slovakia and so on is, is a domestic product. Mm -hmm. uh, and and has the, co the causes are to be found domestically, which doesn't mean that uh, any domestic weakness isn't exploited then strategically by an outside. I think that's what we see in the Balkans as well, is that Russia pursues interests uh, in terms of, I think it's, the, the I think what I would call the, the troublemaking factor. I think there's no strategic kind of commitment to the Balkans from Russia in terms of, uh, you know, trying to establish a kind of sphere of influence. But it has the ability to mess with the European Union Union by proxy. Um, and uh, it uses some kind of rather nostalgic sense of affinity, in particular in Serbia, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, uh, jokingly people say, you know, it's because, uh, because of course, Serbia and part of Yugoslavia didn't experience uh, the long Soviet dominance uh, <laughs> uh, after 1948. So in a certain way, by escaping it through the break in 1948, it, it in a certain way could have this rather nostalgic view of Russia, which, you know, wouldn't be so popular uh, elsewhere. But, um, you know, it's not based on economic ties in terms of foreign, foreign investments. Um, 
it's not based on you know the fact that you know very few Serbia, Serbs uh, have gone to Russia. I mean, people travel to the West. They aspire uh, the the economic well-being of, of of Western Europe. The cultural ties are more with Western Europe. But there is a sense of well, Russia understands us better. Putin protects or has a has a has a convergence of interests. So there is that which which Russia is playing on, and which also again, and this is what matters. Domestic elites use strategically to bolster their electoral support. So it's not mm-hmm. it's not that Russia isn't telling. Telling the uh, Alexander Vucic in Serbia, Mila Radonik, that they should come and see him, but uh, they want to do it because they think they're going to do better in elections. Um, and this has got nothing to do with Russia. It's got something to do with opportunistic uh, political elites who say, "Well, you know, we also want a little bit of Europe um, because that's what citizens want, but we also want a little bit of Russia." So, in a certain way, you know, the citizens want the EU. They want to be like Putin. And you know, how do we combine the best of both worlds, so to speak? Is is, is I think. Right. What, what the strategy is. I'll, I'll take that opportunity actually to inject one of these questions that we got from the audience, which was for non-elites. So, so for the non-elites who aren't seeing the appeal due to their own aspirations, but for non-elites, what is the attraction of Putinism? Is there an attraction for regular citizens, for the population? Alina, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think this goes back to some things we've already been talking about, that people have legitimate grievances, right? Um, you know, the European Union in many ways was established on the premise of prosperity, economic prosperity. So then you have something like the financial crisis, and that doesn't become so guaranteed. Of course, Eastern European countries that have joined the EU have benefited immensely from the integration process. But now there's, you know, the, the, these processes are rapid. In any society where you see very rapid social change, um, there are going to be sort of counter movements and a backlash to that. And, you know, I think what's interesting to see is that these are legitimate grievances about individuals' economic decline in their own communities that are not being productively channeled by the center left or the center right. And that's actually the problem, is that the success of the extremists, the illiberal Democrats, if you want to call them them, has been just as much about the failure of the left and also the right Mm -hmm. to provide a convincing narrative that actively addresses people's anxieties and the threats they might feel. Real or not real, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Um, And until there's a convincing ideology about democracy, like why is democracy something that will be good for you? Mm -hmm. We don't have those kinds of narratives that we can just deploy. And until those come about, I I don't know how the the centrist parties are going to uh, really reinsert themselves into people's hearts and minds. If I could, I could wanted to connect that with another question that we had from the audience, which was, what is then a healthy way, um, a non-corrosive way to engage in skepticism or criticism of the EU? Um, because Euroscepticism, because attacking the EU is so much now a profound phenomenon, um, perhaps even more than nationalism at this point. Um, what is the healthy way? What's the, you know, what's the Democrats' way? What's the Europeanist uh, way to be skeptical or to be critical that doesn't then undermine the, uh, the goals of the project? Well, I think you need, you need a, I think one of the key problems is that uh, the EU uh, narrative, for the, especially for the countries which have joined it, has been, A, there's no alternative, um, mm-hmm. and B, uh, do as we say. Um, uh, which is, of course, that's part of the enlargement process, but it, of course, presents the idea that there's very little agency among citizens. Mm-hmm. That citizens don't really decide. You, you only decide: uh, do you be, are you part of this project, which to which there's no alternative, or are you not? And once you're in, you have to do. And then you, you know, urgent, you know, parliaments of the region pass through urgent procedures, dozens of laws, which not even the legislators know, uh, not to mention the citizens. So I think what you need to do is you understand that there is a substantial core to the European Union, and it needs, there needs to be a debate, and there needs to be a discussion. And being skeptical of EU policies doesn't mean you're a Eurosceptic, right? right? I mean, you know, nobody would say, I don't like the policies of the American government. Well, that doesn't make me anti-American, right? Um, or I don't like the policies of the German government. That doesn't make me anti-German. But there's always this assumption, if you criticize the EU, the policies of the EU, of the current administration, you're anti-EU. And I think we have to separate that. And I think that, that in a certain way we need to open the space to having a debate about the policies of the European Union without necessarily saying, well, that doesn't mean that we are against the European Union. 
So I think the the, the the kind of pro-EU side of the story has been too defensive about saying, don't attack the EU, keep it, you know, don't criticize it. Uh, and by, by, by doing that in a certain way, said that any criticism of the EU by extent is actually a rejection of the EU as such. And I think that is, that is I think, a, a weakness. Mm -hmm. Alina, did you? I want to just quickly follow up on that if I can. Um, on a more positive note, I think Europeans in general uh, take for granted a lot of the benefits that they receive, particularly young people um, who have grown up in open borders. Right. They can travel wherever they want. They can take their you know, Erasmus years abroad, et cetera. And this privilege has been extended to these you know, former socialist countries is, is incredible. Um, and I think despite maybe them not even knowing it, young people in particular are becoming Europeans in, in, in this very kind of broad sense of the term. Uh, be, because honestly, if some of these rollbacks happen, people would not want them. They don't want you know, having to have border checks and visas and you know, not being able to visit their friends across the border these days. Um, so in many ways, I think, uh, despite pe what people think about EU policy, um, the reality of what European institutions have been able to bring, the kind of benefits that people have been able to reap from those institutions are incredibly significant. And I think what the EU has not done a good job of is uh, communicating that to people. It's kind of like, you know, in the United States, we complain about paying taxes because we don't really know what our taxes are doing <laughs> uh, because they're not being communicated to us in a, in a clear way. Um, and that's also something that you could do a better job of. Annabelle, do you, do you agree that Europeanism is a, is a shared position among young people now? Well, I mean, this is, this is, I think young people are, to a certain extent, the problem in Poland and, mm -hmm. and in, in, in Europe more broadly. There's this whole... Um, Sort of lost generation, one could say again. And Alina is mentioning, you know, young people and growing up with free borders and so on, open borders. But that's something that I think young people take for granted. And in, in Poland, in particular, you can see this in support. So law and justice, this ruling party, did very well among young people. But when they do kind of, you know, make believe um, election polls in in high schools, then um, young people there vote for even more radical populists mm -hmm. and so on, like this uh, rock star Pavel Kukis and so on. And um, Opposition to refugees as well. I think that um, the 18 to 24 age group is most um, anti-refugee in Poland. And so I think that's something that the EU should be thinking about because the, their parents' generation and so on um, knows what freedom is to a certain extent. Mm. Yeah. This is related. Also a question from the audience. And I encourage people to continue to write them down if you have additional ones. So the things we're talking about, these positions of um, isolationism, um, anti-national, anti-globalization, um, traditional values. These are phenomena that are happening across, um, around the world, um, not only in Eurasia and in Europe. And to some degree, they reflect um, popular positions, legitimate positions that people hold within a spectrum um, within a, a democratic society. And so how can those be reconciled? Can they be reconciled um, with the democratic project, particularly in Europe, um, given the basis of the European Union as a uh, economic and a values union. Do you think they can be incorporated, or, or is the conflict inevitable as policy makers? I mean, I would, I would say here that, I mean, the question is what is, you know, what, to which degree is that position, the kind of nativist position, you know, which you often have, um, a response to some, something else? Um, I mean, I think, and it comes back to the issue of what do we consider to be, you know, is it a liberal democracy we strive for or pure majoritarianism, right? Because, I mean, you know, majoritarianism can accommodate everything, right? It can say as long as the majority wants it, we can, you know, abolish the separation of church and state or we can, we can uh, you know, persecute minorities, uh, persecute or, minorities yeah. or not welcome refugees, uh, ignore international law, all of those things we can do. Um, but that's majoritarianism, right? The whole definition of liberal democracy is that there are certain restraints on the will of the majority based on certain values and norms which are enshrined in law. Um, and so in that sense, there, is a, there are no-go areas of, of, of where a liberal democracy cannot go. So, you know, saying we only want Christian refugees, we don't want other people who are fleeing a war, is not a legitimate position in a liberal democracy. As is saying, you know, minorities have to, you know, don't, can't, don't have the right to learn their language or have to be, have to be marginalized uh, or not protecting in a certain way against hate speech. 
all of that is part of liberal democracy. Now, it doesn't, and I think it's it's a false debate in many ways because I think the the xenophobia or the is, is, is or the kind of these positions are a reflection of fear, mm-hmm. right? So they're driven by fear, um, and so instead of taking the fear seriously, you have to take seriously what triggers the fear. Um, so I don't think it helps to say, well, you know, we have to have a policy which is more majoritarian and less liberal, but rather you have to go back and, and analyze um, what is it which makes people support that. Why are young people supporting, uh, you know, extreme populist parties? Um, and it's not because they are necessarily ideologically committed to it, but because they have certain grievances mm-hmm. which they don't see addressed otherwise. So you have to address the grievances. And these grievances are not that they cannot stand the company of Muslims or that they cannot stand minorities, but it's usually fear of losing something. It's, and you know, the, the fear of loss is the pro- most powerful force in extremist politics. Uh, and I think uh, this is something which, which you know, having studied extensively the wars of the 1990s in Yugoslavia, this is what drove the wars. It's the, it's the fear of losing something you felt you were entitled to. Um, and you know, without going into the reasons of whether you were or not, but uh, so I think this is this is you know and we see it in, in in the United States at the moment and we see it in Western Europe and we see it in Central Europe. So it's 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 not different. It expresses itself differently. But I think you know you, you don't have to take their supposed uh, spokespeople, um, but you have to look at the grievances which are underpinning it, and they can be addressed. They can be addressed within a liberal democracy. I think it's also ignorance. So fear from ignorance. Most Polish people have, in, you know, in the provinces, have never met a Muslim person, and so on. So they sort of do not know one, you know. And so it's a very strange debate in Poland and also in the Baltic states because there's all this talk about refugees and so on. But unlike in Hungary or in Austria and so on, there aren't any refugees and so on. So it's a it's sort of preemptive fear and so on. And I think that's something that um, these radical parties are really like manipulating and taking advantage of. It, just to add on that point a bit, I mean, if we look at, um, you know, research studies that look at does the percentage of migrants in a country actually directly lead to uh, an increase in support for the far right, there's not a clear relationship there, in fact, mm-hmm. um, which is surprising to a lot of people. There's also not such a clear relationship between economic declines, like increasing unemployment and support for the far right. Um, so I think what this shows us is that these fears and threats don't have to be represented in reality, right? It's really about how these narratives are shaped and channeled for political gains and political means by certain political entrepreneurs or political leaders. And I think you know, going back to some of the things you were talking about earlier, Annabelle, the, this idea of, culture, of a lost generation of young people, I think you're absolutely right about that. You know, if you look at not just places like Poland or Eastern Europe, but Greece, Mm -hmm. Uh, where you still have incredibly high unemployment rates since the financial crisis in Spain, Italy as well, and in Portugal. Um, What are these young people going to do? They don't have the same life chances as their parents did. Um, And so Europe is in this critical moment where it could have a lost generation, not just in Central Eastern Europe, but also in Western Mm -hmm. Europe. And again, you uh, you have this paradox where these young people who have this deep sense of economic loss or cultural loss um, are supporting perhaps the extremes. Um, and I think that's a problem of communication, right? Mm-hmm. Because they do take for granted all of the things that they benefit from, from European integration. Uh, people maybe don't really even think that the fact that you can go across the border is a part of the EU process, right? Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of it does have to do with how st- strategic or non strategic the EU has been about communicating the benefits that these young people are reaping despite the economic and losses that they're feeling at the same time. I can just jump in here. I mean, I think Mm -hmm. I totally agree with what you said, Alina, but I think it also matters how, let's say, governments or leading parties and leading political actors respond to it. And I think, you know, if you you take a country, um, you know, some central, uh, some, let's say, uh, in Germany, there's been a very clear sense among the core political parties that you know you don't talk about refugees in this kind of hostile way, and there's a kind of a, a broad social consensus which is you know which is challenged, which is you know put under pressure, but under pressure, having had you know one million refugees come into the country within one year. Uh, while if you see in some countries in Central Europe, like in Slovakia, where you see you know governing parties from you know who are self-declared social democrats who can say you know we only want Christians. Um, so so I think you know if 
if leading parties and prime ministers and ministers can say that, you know, what, you know, what is radical then for a radical party to say, go one step further? So I think it's about establishing a social consensus of saying, this is socially acceptable and this is not socially acceptable. So if you say refugees uh, should not come and they should only, you know, they should adhere to our values and, and define them in a very ridiculous manner, then, um, you know, I think that kind of social positioning of of, you know, of a society of what are the values and if you if you don't endorse them you're out of out of the acceptable realm of politics has not happened in many central uh, and East European countries and you know we have the institutions but as long as there are parties who are willing you know mainstream parties and mainstream actors and mainstream media who are willing to undermine uh, these values then of course what is the kind of firewall to the extreme right and I think this is what you were pointing out earlier is that that line is blurred you don't know is smear an extreme right wing party officially it isn't but in, in terms of its statements it is and the same goes for you know many both left and right wing parties across central uh, and eastern europe and that makes it very difficult for a voter to say well when am i leaving the terrain of mainstream politics and entering the the terrain of extremist politics i think i think that's part of the problem because in poland um, in the ruling law and justice party and in general there's been a kind of backlash against political correctness right. No, like consciously in the sense that, you know, we're not going to like bury these things under the surface and so on. And I think that in, in Germany, for example, there is this consensus that you cannot say these things. And no matter what people will say in private, you know, they will have concerns. You cannot make political issues out of them. So there needs to be a, a space for a healthy way of discussing these things that doesn't cede the entire territory to extremist groups, I mean, far-right groups. A lot of this, unfortunately, sounds very familiar from the United States right now. Um, we have a question, actually, that maybe is, uh, I can speak to if others don't feel they want to, but it's about the dictatorships in Eurasia. Um, so I know this is a little farther afield from um, you all, our panelists. But the question was, are they too far gone to promote democratic values in them? Or is there a way for democracies, in particular in the West, to engage with countries like Azerbaijan um, in the midst of this crackdown? So I don't, if anyone has anything to say, please feel free. I'm also happy to speak. Um, you know, I, I think right now the economic crisis in uh, in Eurasia, the economic crisis that's striking these dictatorships um, across the region um, is presenting a kind of opportunity um, in a perverse way um, for the United States and for the West. I think the United States and the West have more leverage right now than they have had um, for, let's say, at least since 2002 um, in Central Asia and in the South Caucasus when we talk about Azerbaijan. Um, the economic crisis is the first region reason, meaning that these dictatorships lack the resources that they could always, or are quickly losing the resources that they've always drawn on to uh, maintain very staunch um, anti-democratic or sovereigntist positions. Um, they also aren't needed as much for the war in Afghanistan, which as uh, those who've worked on Central Asia know, um, this was the defining issue for all of Central Asian policy for a very long time. Um, when the Pakistani route was threatened um, and the Northern Distribution Network for supplying the war in Afghanistan became so critical. Um, that logic is perhaps not completely gone, but much diminished. And I think as a result um, of these two factors, the economic crisis of the change in Afghanistan, um, I think the United States in particular has a much stronger uh, position um, and much less to lose. Um, which makes you a stronger negotiator, potentially, if you're willing to use that leverage, um, to, to, to say to these governments, um, what has been said before but has always been somewhat undermined in practice, which is that there are very strict limits to how far this cooperation and how far this relationship can go um, without improvements uh, on democracy. And also the self-interested argument for these dictatorships that the economic problems you are facing, the issues that you are going through right now are directly connected to a lack of transparency and a lack of accountability in your political systems, which transfers into your economic systems. Um, the amount of money that you have made over the last 15 and 20 years, spent wisely and spent well, as you've been urged to do, um, probably would have created a much stronger buffer for this kind of situation. You would be in a better position. Um, and so now is the moment to take on those reforms. But that's my pitch. Um, I just want to follow up on that. I mean, not directly speaking to the specific question of Azerbaijan, but I think you bring up a really good point, Nate, which is this question of um, the U.S. Uh, role in all of this, right? Um, you know, unfortunately, I think what we've seen over the last 
you know, 10 years, has been a profound disengagement from, on the part outside the US from the region that we're talking about. Um, a profound disengagement in our foreign policy, in our political will to invest, to see this as a, as a key strategic region in which the US has a, a continuous role to play. And I think the, the policy under the last, and this administration has also been to really let Germany take the lead. So you empower Germany to take the lead on Europe to deal with the European problems. But I think, you know, for somebody uh, like Merkel and Germany in general, this is a really awkward position to be in. Because I think it's awkward for Germany to lead on some of these issues because of the history that Germany has on the continent. I think it's very obvious. Um, so I think looking at that, uh, and I think with, until there's a profound switch in how a US policy looks at Eastern Europe specifically and Europe more broadly, um, I don't know how much movement we're going to get on some of these issues, to be honest with you. And I don't know what that's going to look like given our current politics. Um, in this electoral cycle. Right. Um, I hope if there are other questions, please write them down. And, and I, then I wanted just to go and ask you all, um, maybe for a final comment, about what you're looking ahead to right now in 2016 um, from each of you. What are the things that you're, the thing or things, if you have multiple, I guess it's OK, um, that in this year, in 2016, you are anticipating or, or see as being critical moments that are forthcoming? I think the, the NATO summit in, in Warsaw in July, which is going to be very important. Well, I mean, in, in terms of the discussion about security in, in the region with the United States and in Europe and how much of a presence there is. But I think it's also important domestically for Poland because it's a, a sort of a test of how well the government copes with this um, international spotlight and the sort of wh whether it manages to um, repair its image through that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would... I would say the, the probably the biggest uh, event uh, is going to be the Brexit referendum in many ways, um, in the sense that uh, whether, because it seems unclear whether Britain will leave the European Union uh, or not. And but it seems a possibility. Exactly. The very fact that it is a possibility and has become a possibility um, means that it becomes a crucial uh, test because, again, I mean, the EU has been in a crisis management mode for the last eight years, essentially, ever since the economic crisis, you know, in one way or the other. There was the economic, the banking crisis, the, the Greek crisis, a Greek crisis again in multiple reincarnations, refugees. And the, the EU has really been unable to, in a certain way, find its step in terms of being uh, trying to act, to take the initiative rather than just responding to the latest fire. It's been a fire brigade, essentially, putting out fire. Uh, and, you know, that's not what the EU does best. And so the kind of strategic, structural uh, kind of... Uh, you know, commitment to, to, to change and to reform has not been on the agenda because it's been about all dealing with problems. And, uh, you know, of course, if Britain votes out, uh, of course, that will be the big crisis which will dominate the EU for the next two years, if not more, because there will be discussion about the future relationship with Britain. Uh, it probably will encourage parties to aim for a referendum in other countries. I mean, when they're Eurosceptic, it will question, quest, it'll raise questions about survival of Britain. It will also, I think, you know, and I think this is closely connected to the, we haven't talked about the Dutch referendum on the Ukraine, but I think it's not just important for the Ukraine, it's important for, for enlargement. Um, because basically, if the Dutch voters can reject uh, a free trade agreement with the Ukraine, which is, you know, I don't know of any other referendum on a free trade agreement held previously in Europe or anywhere. Um, it's a very insignificant agreement, essentially. Exactly. It's insignificant. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, economically insignificant, substantially insignificant. And it was picked up by uh, Eurosceptics in the Netherlands as a test case to basically sabotage EU integration. Um, it had nothing to do with the Ukraine. It had nothing to do to do with, with free trade. It had everything to do with Euroscepticism. And that's where the Russian influence kind of played a very, very, uh, very negative role. Um, but of course, it means that the Netherlands can organize a referendum on any future enlargement um, of the Western Balkans. And France has said similarly. And why would French or Dutch voters support uh, Serbia, Montenegro, any of them to join. I mean, the numbers are staggeringly uh, skeptical towards enlargement. And that is actually, in terms of substantial consequences, more real than a free trade agreement with the Ukraine. So I think the risk is really that enlargement is off the agenda. I mean, yes, the EU pretends there's enlargement, but in effect, 
as long as they are, as, as long as citizens can vote and potentially in one country, I mean, you know, it takes, and in the Netherlands, turnout was 30%. So, you know, so if 30% of one country of 28 say no to enlargement, enlargement is dead. Uh, and uh, I think, and, and it's not just about, you know, will Serbia or Montenegro join, but it's been the main engine for reform uh, in these countries. And uh, so I think this is, you know, these are, I think, crucial questions. I mean, they won't be resolved this year, but I think we've been pretending enlargement is going on. Mm -hmm over the last decade. And I think the Dutch referenda shows us, you know, we're fooling ourselves in effect that with the current mechanisms, with the current process, enlargement will continue. It will not continue unless there's a, either a structural change in the way the European Union approaches it or an economic kind of political transformation which will make citizens more, take a more benefit, you know, kind of a more uh, positive view of, e of the EU and by extension of enlargement. But you know, save th that kind of a large kind of tectonic shift, uh, that process is, is over. Um, and, and I'd piggyback on that to say that in an area that we only mention in the report, but which is obviously of great importance to the report in, in the relationship with Turkey, um, you have a case where the EU has also now cooperated in pretending that there is enlargement. I mean, that, that process, the, the sped up accession process that's been, now been agreed in exchange for the migration deal is a pretend process. There is no, um, there has not been for years, but there certainly is not now any conceivable way that Turkey joins the EU. And yet chapters being opened is now becoming a bargaining chip for other um, advantages in a, in a way that's even more flagrant than it has been perhaps in Serbia. And it gives an argument to Euroskeptics because Very Euroskeptics much. can say, well, this is not about values, it's not about right. reforms, it's about you know, geopolitical rewards. And so that argument can be then used to undermine you know, the actual structural enlargement processes which have been genuine in, in the Western Balkans, at least in terms of the, the procedures. Um, and so you can say, well, this is all fake. It's all, you know, it's all just part of, of paying off countries by making them false promises. And of course, why wouldn't they in return make fake reforms? If you offer fake integration, we offer you fake reforms. And, you know, both sides are faking it to convince, you know, their own citizens or their own constituencies. But the end result is neither reforms nor enlargement. And, you know, that's hardly a promising future. So, Alina, I'll give you the last word on 2016. Oh, that's a lot to follow up on. Uh, just to quickly respond before I get to my answer uh, to your direct question, Nate. Um, I think we tended to see EU enlargement as a linear process. Mm. Uh, because of the, the, the rapid nature of over the last you know, 60 years. Uh, but in fact, that was just an assumption. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason to think that it's going to be a linear process going forward. I think what you're pointing to is exactly right, that EU enlargement, EU integration happened during an unprecedented period of economic prosperity. And when the economic prosperity is challenged by the financial crisis, the refugee crisis, et cetera, then the enlargement process may not go on in the same linear fashion. It may look more like waves up and down. I'm not saying that in 20 years we won't see another wave of enlargement, but I think for the short term or maybe even the medium term, I think you're absolutely right. It is this sort of um, you know, kabuki theater that's being played by both sides. Um, but you know, going back to 2016 and what's coming, I think uh, just to go back to some of the opening remarks you said, you talked about, Nate, um, you know, Ukraine. I think 2016 is going to be a really key year for Ukraine, and I thought this for some time. This is in particular because, you know, in 2015 it was unclear that Ukraine would get the kind of financial injection that it would need to actually sustain itself as a country. And I think there was this fear that it would just completely fall apart, but it hasn't. Despite the political crisis, there is still a Ukrainian state. Right, they're still functioning. Um, it's not just devolved into anarchy or anything like that. I mean, this is a very kind of uh, Hobbesian vision, but I don't see that happening in Ukraine. So now Ukraine actually has the funds from the European partners and the international community and the United States to carry out the kinds of reforms that are stipulated by uh, them receiving these grants. And so we're going to have to see if they can really take the reins and make it happen. And I think we underestimate how important Ukraine is. There's this tendency of Ukraine fatigue to kind of want to brush under the rug. And, you know, there's some fighting going on in the East. You know, Crimea is basically Russia. Let's just forget about it and go on with business as usual. Um, but I think that kind of narrative, uh, as those of us who follow these issues, who care about what happens in the region, we have to make an effort to counter that narrative as much as we can in our own individual capacities or in our organizational capacities, uh, particularly because, 
What happens in Ukraine has profound consequences to the region as a whole. If Ukraine is not able to move towards Europe, to move towards the West, which the majority of Ukrainians now want for the first time in Ukraine's history, the majority of Ukrainians want to join NATO. And they only, and that's, they only have uh, you know, Putin to thank for that. Um, because before that, there was no consensus on this. Ukraine didn't see itself so squarely moving towards Western institutions. Um, and what happens in Ukraine is just you know, sets a precedent for how Russia will approach other countries in near abroad um, and how the West, Europe, and the U.S. will respond. And if you can have Ukraine succeed as a liberal democracy with economic market institutions, I think from looking at that from the Russian perspective, that feels threatening. Because for Russians, and for Mr. Putin specifically, um, if you believe what the Russian propaganda put out, Ukraine was just like Russia. So if Ukraine can have a liberal democracy that's successful, that can lead towards economic prosperity, that could also happen in Russia. And of course, for an authoritarian regime like what we have in Russia today, that is a very dangerous idea and a very dangerous precedent. And that's why we have to, when we think about the reversal of these authoritarian trends, Ukraine is at the epicenter of this. And that's why I think 2016 will be an interesting year to watch for what happens. Thank you. Uh, and I think we can end on wholeheartedly endorsing that from Freedom House's <laughs> perspective on the importance of Ukraine. Thank you all um, for an excellent conversation, for an excellent panel, and thank you to our audience. Um, we'll be here to speak with you a little bit more. Um, thank you. Thanks for having us. <laughs>